a people of the cross. Jesus and the cross-shaped nature of the kingdom forms the way Christians live in community. In the imagination of the book of Revelation, Christians are not marked by the beastly ways we too often treat one another. Rather, God's people are a people marked by the Lamb, coming from Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. Christ's followers are daily taking up their cross and following the ways of Jesus. Christian discipleship does not separate us from the concerns of the world around us, quite the opposite. However, it does mean that we find it difficult, if not impossible at times, to fit fully into the various worldly political categories. The church in every culture finds itself embodying a politic the world cannot understand in terms of heart from Christ. It is wonderful to see you this morning. I would invite you to take a Bible with me this morning and turn to a couple of places. I'd love for you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, the 20th chapter. Um, and also 1 Peter, the second chapter. In just a moment, we'll go to Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, and 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. But as you turn there, I, I just want to say a few things um, as we get started this morning. So... Today we are, are finishing uh, this little series that we began a few weeks ago, thinking about uh, the vision for the new creation and several of the core values or core convictions for us as a church in this time. As we've gone through it, I, I've realized they kind of fall into three groups. Um, the very first one, which is a call to holiness, is just the essence of what it means to be part of the new creation that we are not waiting to be what God wants us to be when we die, but that right now in the body, in our lives, the spirit of God can transform us to be reflections of Christ and to be holy as he is holy. And, and that's the very essence of the new creation. A couple of the weeks we spent thinking about what I, I would kind of categorize as practices or ways that we are formed so that we are shaped by a scripture uh, scripture imagination, a scripture formed imagination. And I, I want us to be a people who are so immersed in the scripture that like this pair of glasses that I put on today, the scripture becomes like the lenses through which we interpret the world and our lives. Um, Pastor Brent a few weeks ago shared with us about what it means to be a people of worship, that we are, that we are constantly, to use Paul's language, being squeezed into the mold of the world around us through various practices and ways that our lives are shaped and pushed and pulled, but you are here today to give yourself over bodily to the things of God and to be formed and to be shaped in worship to be who we were created to be. And then these last four weeks, we really thought about what I realized are kind of postures of God's people. A few weeks ago, we thought about having a posture of hope. What, what does it mean for it? That doesn't mean, by the way, that only good things happen, but that means that even when we lament at the terrible things that happen often in our world, we do that not in despair, but in hope that he who called us is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine. And so we do that in hope. And, and we have a particular posture that we're looking for a kind of Pentecostal unity, but not by making us all the same. Some of you, you know, offense, but you're kind of weird compared to me today. And uh, thank God for you. Thank God for us odd folk who are together being made into the body of Christ, not in uniformity, but in the beauty of God's created diversity. And, and we are a people who not only desire that, but celebrate that and look forward to the, the new creation, the new Jerusalem, where all the kings of the earth, all of the nations and languages will, will gather together. We want to embody that in our life today. And last week we talked about how we are an evangelistic people. This is good news that we don't just keep to ourselves, but we are postured to not just gather each week, but to be sent each week into the world, to be the beautiful feet of those who bring good news and speak peace to the world. This morning, I want us to think about one more posture. We actually skipped this one a few weeks ago, but it, it's worked out okay because here on this first Sunday of this Lenten season, we think about what it means to be a people of the cross. I'm, I'm going to use a fancy theological word today, but what does it mean to be shaped by cruciformity, to be a people formed by the cross? But before we jump in the text, if, if you grab one of the notebooks, if you have one, or if you grab one on the way out today, I do want to kind of take 
put the end of the sermon at the beginning today to say, especially if you're new with us, both online or in person, and these things resonate with you. And the question becomes, then how, what do we do? Like, how do I respond to this? Let me encourage you to kind of respond in these ways. To first of all, engage. One of the challenges of being a, a fairly large church is it's, it's easy to be anonymous for too long. And would love if you sense God calling you to be part of this church. And by the way, we are just the small C church in the, in the midst of the capital C church. But we do get to kind of live out our lives as disciples in community, caring for each other. And, and would love for you to engage, perhaps even pursue membership. Uh, the first week of April on that Wednesday night, we're going to have a membership class. We'll have some online options. But if you're not a member yet and you feel kind of a tug, we would love to at least tell you what that means and pray with you about whether God's leading you to be part of this community at this time. We'd love for you to not be anonymous for very long, but connect. Um, large churches are actually just gatherings of a whole bunch of little small churches together in unity. And we call those things small groups and Sunday school classes and other ways where we get in connection with other brothers and sisters in Christ and we get to encourage each other and pray for each other and edify each other. And so if you haven't found a place of connection, let us help you find a place of connection. And we are the body of Christ in service. And so you have gifts that the body needs. As Paul says, the ear and the eye need each other. The hand and the foot need each other. We need the gifts that God has given to you. And so help us explore what what that looks like, both here in the church, but also as an extension of the body of Christ in the community. And then together we are called to witness to this life that Christ is forming in us. And, and so we'd love for you to, to consider walking into that with us. But this morning, I, I wanna think about this last posture. I wanna think about cruciformity. So again, if you have your Bible and you've found Matthew 20, if you're able this morning, if you would stand with me in honor of the Lord's word, as we look together at Matthew, the 20th chapter, Verses 20 through 28, and then we'll go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus along with her sons. Bowing before him, she asked a favor of him. What do you want? He asked. She responded, say that these two sons of mine will sit one on your right hand and one on your left in your kingdom. Jesus replied, oh, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink from the cup that I'm about to drink from? They said to him, we can. And he said to them, you will drink from my cup. But to sit at my right or left hand isn't mine to give. It belongs to those for whom my father prepared it. Now, when the other 10 disciples heard about this, they became angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called them over and said, you know that those who rule the Gentiles show off their authority over them and their high ranking officials order them around. But please underline this line. But that's not the way it will be with you. Whoever wants to be great among you will be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you will be your slave. Just as the human one didn't come to be served, but rather to serve and to give his life to liberate many people. And now turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. Once you hadn't received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, since you are immigrants and strangers in the world, I urge that you avoid worldly desires that wage war against your lives. Live honorably among the unbelievers. Today they defame you as if you were doing evil, but in the day when God visits to judge, they will glorify him because they have observed your honorable deeds. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So not just this morning, but during the season, uh, we will think about, talk about, preach about, sing about the cross. And so it's appropriate that we think about what does it mean for us to be a cruciformed people, a people of the cross. 
As we think about that, talk about that, preach about that, sing about that in this season, one of the things that I think we'll notice is that actually the, the cross becomes actually a fairly complex thing, both theologically and there's kind of multiple aspects of what the cross means into our lives. And so I want to reflect on some of those this morning. And I, for those of you who are taking notes this morning, this is a one-time offer. Some of you know how much I hate alliteration. In fact, uh, I just finished my online grad preaching class and I would give myself a C for what I'm about to do today. I want to talk about four things about the cross that all start with the letter P today. But it's not my fault. It's my friend, Mike Lodal, um, who wrote a wonderful book, Story of God, that I've spent a couple of decades at least teaching in theology class. And when he talks about the cross, he comes up with these four aspects of the cross and he figures out how to get them all to start with the letter P. So I'm gonna blame Mike today, but here they are. The first is certainly when we think about the cross, that there is a priestly aspect to the cross, a priestly aspect to the cross. What we mean when we say that is when we think about the priests in the Old Testament, the priests have a particular function. They are intended to take the needs and concerns and particularly at times the sins and brokenness of the people and go into the tabernacle or the temple, go into the Holy of Holies and offer the needs, the brokenness, the sins of the people, offer that up to God. And God at the mercy seat receives that in grace and mercy. And then the priests go back to the people as a mediator of God's mercy and grace and transformation back to the people. So in this brokenness between God and humankind, the priest serves as a kind of mediator that offers the sins to God, but then offers the mercy of God back to the people. And so certainly when we think about the cross and and I would say the majority of the hymns and songs that we will sing during this season in one way or another will reflect upon this aspect of the cross that when we look at the cross, we can say with assurance that whatever boundary exists between God and humankind has been eliminated by the grace and mercy of God. That there is no sin or brokenness. There is no amount of of rebellion in our lives that can exempt us from the vastness of the mercy and love of God that we see in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If the killing of God's self-revelation can't separate us from God, nothing, Paul says, in all creation then can separate us from the love of God that we see in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, often as we talk about that, there are ways I'm going to want to shape that and do shape that with you. I get a little nervous sometimes when we think about the priestly aspect of the cross that we are careful not to kind of form two gods. God the Father, the angry God who needs some kind of payment for sin and Jesus, the merciful God who decides to become that payment. Certainly there are some sacrificial aspects to the cross, but... But in the mystery of the cross, I think we certainly want to affirm that whatever sacrifice is necessary, God becomes in Christ. Amen. And there is no boundary now between us and Christ. And, and that's important. The other thing I would say about that though, and it concerns me every once in a while, as much as I want to affirm that, sing about that, talk about that, preach about that, Sometimes, and I think especially maybe in American contemporary Christianity, we can stop right there when we talk about the cross. We can talk about the cross as the symbol of God's grace and forgiveness and mercy upon us. Absolutely, amen to all of that. But here's the problem. In each of the gospels, Jesus also gets the disciples together and says this, if you want to be my disciple, do this, take up your cross and follow me. And so if the cross is simply a kind of priestly function of opening a way between us and God, of justifying a broken relationship between us and God, then between you and me, I have no idea what that means then for me to take up my cross and follow Jesus. For certainly whatever I would do is not an atonement for any kind of sin. 
And if the cross is simply about the relationship between God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit and us, then, then what does it mean for us to participate in that? And that's where I think these other aspects become really important for us to think about. And so let me give you the second one. We think about the cross as a priestly function, but we also think about the cross as the presence of God in suffering. The unique presence of God in suffering. For although we talk about the cross often as taking on our sin, we also talk about the cross as Jesus taking on our shame. It's, it's interesting to me, actually, that the cross, this first century symbol, well, this first century means of execution, and not just a, a means of execution, but an ugly, violent, public, shame-inducing form of execution. As one church historian has put it, if there's a way to be violent in the world, the Romans figured it out. That this is public, as a more contemporary theologian, the wonderful African-American theologian James Cone has said, maybe in our own time, the closest thing we have to the cross is the lynching tree. A means of saying to folks who push against the system, who we don't think fit in the system. It's a way of saying to them, here's what happens to those who rebel. And let's make a public display of them. And let's make this a source of fear so that all who look there see a curse and say, we will not do that. For by the way, one of the only ways oppressive systems can stay oppressive is to create fear in those they oppress. And so one of the powerful things that we testify about the cross is that Christ takes on our shame, stripped bare, publicly hung, whipped and flogged and mocked. He's entered into the place of those who've been abused and misused and marginalized and, and who have had violence enacted upon them. And in the mystery of who God is, God in Christ goes to those places of shame and abandonment. I said this to you before, and it's not an exact quote, but, but kind of a paraphrase of one of my favorite theologians, a guy named Jürgen Moltmann, will often say it's so important to us when Jesus cries out on the cross and prays Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That we recognize that God in Christ is praying a prayer of God abandonment. So that God in Christ has gone to the places we think of as God abandonment. And here's the key line. So now we can say there is no place or no one called God abandoned because God in Christ has gone to all of the places of God abandonment. Now, if you're not with me this morning, that was such good preaching. Come on. The cross is our acknowledgement that Christ is present in all of those places of hurt and loss and abandonment. And if you are in this room today as a person who has been deeply sinned against, the cross is a reminder that you are not ignored or unknown by God, but that God in Christ has come to your places of hurt and damage. This morning, in the brokenness of these last couple of weeks, I can stand here and say with all assuredness, we do not have to doubt where Christ is today. That's right. For the unique presence of Christ huddles with those in bomb shelters this morning. That's right. Christ is with those refugees, hopeless, wanting to know where home will be found. And Christ is there. And by the way, because Christ is there, we who follow Christ are there. And are willing to put ourselves in those places of God abandonment. One of the things I say so often I love about the church of Nazarene is we're the church for places nobody thought anything good could come from them. And so we find ourselves in those locations. We're not afraid of the darkness of those locations because Christ has gone and is present there. 
Just can I say, in light of that, um, if you're interested to kind of know where the Church of Nazarene is and is active this morning, um, I would encourage you, those of you who are kind of Facebook users, to go to Eurasia region. I mean, you can search that Nazarene Eurasia region and get kind of constant updates about what's going on there. There's wonderful videos this morning of, of some dear friends, Jay and Tiana Sundberg, uh, whose daughter Jenna actually is a student here at NNU. Um, who serve the church in Poland and have been truly, on, literally on the front lines over these last couple of weeks, being sources of hospitality and care and um, supply and, and meeting the needs of refugees as they cross that border. And I want to say again, if you are interested in helping the church in that way, you can just go to NCM, which stands for Nazarene Compassionate Ministries, ncm.org backslash Ukraine and participate in that way. Christ is present in our brokenness. There is no place called God forsaken because God in Christ has gone to the places of forsakenness. But the third, and, and I think Lodal has to do so, uh, some calisthenics here to get a pee out of it, but it's nice. The third is the, the princely aspect, what Mike calls the princely aspect or the kingly aspect, the... In Latin, we sometimes refer to this, this as the Christus victor, the victory of God at the cross. Which is so strange to say. I know we get used to saying it, but it's just odd to say it, that somehow the cross is God's victory. If we had more time this morning, I'd do what I've done the last couple of weeks and kind of walk you through the whole Bible and explore the ways that some imagination shifts. But let me just quickly say, it's interesting to me in the Old Testament that largely when the people imagined a redeemer, a rescuer, a Messiah, they imagined that in the terms of David, especially in terms of the ability to bring conquest and power and authority and might. But please, as you kind of work your way through the Old Testament, pay attention to all the ways that as soon as Israel kind of gets involved in the aspects of kingship, it doesn't take very long. In fact, David's son Solomon just kind of moves into forms of power that become actually destructive. And even though you have these kings of Israel and Judah, some of them are good, most of them bad. But when they're bad, it's because they're trying to redeem the world in the very terms the world uses to try to redeem things. But it's like the more they try to do that, the messier it gets. And then a fascinating thing happens again in the prophet Isaiah, a beginning of a reimagination. Pastor Brent read the text for us. We get these texts that we refer to now as the suffering servant text, where the prophet begins to have a new imagination that perhaps what is happening, the prophet says to Israel, is we've been waiting to have deliverance through a kind of conquest. But maybe here's the problem. Maybe we imagine that God can only win if he wins, right? But maybe winning for God isn't winning. Maybe winning for God is healing. That was really good, by the way. That maybe winning for God isn't conquest, but is healing. And healing often doesn't take place using the tools that the world too often leans upon. It's their trust in chariots and horses. Maybe even the kind of life that we've had that has been a life filled with an awful lot of suffering and suffering love. Perhaps God has used us and perhaps the expectations we have is of a servant who will be wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. But this great line, but by his stripes, we are healed. It's fascinating when the New Testament opens, the disciples still kind of had that imagination so that they see clearly the spirit of God is at work in this person, Jesus, and amazing things are happening. The new creation is breaking out. The kingdom is coming. And so it's just like them to get their mother to come to Jesus and say, hey, get Jesus to put us at the right and the left. He'll say no to us, but you're our mother. He might say yes to you. He's got a soft heart for moms. And so the text that we read 
James and John's mother say, hey, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, which clearly is going to be a kingdom of power and contact, and conquest, how about if my kids get to be kind of second in line, third in line, at the right and the left? To which Jesus says, you don't really even know what you're asking. For this is not a kingdom that wins through power. The princely nature of the cross is that here is how God thinks about winning, thinks about it through healing, the restoration of all things, and how will that be restored? Through self-giving love. And so Jesus invites the disciples to not just love their neighbor, but to love their enemy as well. To think of creative ways to both stand with those who have been damaged and hurt. And so this is not a call for them to continue to be abused. This is a call to stand with those, but to imagine what it means then to be participants in the healing of the world so that we don't just continue these cycles of violence, but that truly we can be those beautiful feet who proclaim peace into the world. which then leads to the last, which is the prophetic nature of the cross. There's a priestly aspect and a presence aspect, and there is, there's certainly a princely or victory aspect of the cross, but there is also a prophetic aspect. One of the things that will strike me every time we come through Lent is when we get to the crucifixion story, with the exception of just a handful of women who've stayed with Jesus to the very end, everybody else, their sin is deeply exposed at the cross. N nobody gets off easy. Disciples clearly come off as kind of knuckleheads who don't really get this at all and are far more shaped by their fears than by their faith. The principalities and powers, as has happened in our own world these last couple of weeks. They just get exposed for what they are. This sort of power hungry <laughs> folks who grab at power and who think it's better for one person to die than for the system to be messed up. Worst of all, it would be great if it were just kind of the unbelievers who got exposed at the cross, but it is also the place where the religious folk get exposed. Where our brokenness is revealed. Also in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus invites us to love our enemies, to be instruments of healing, to be peacemakers in the world, he gives us some fascinating instructions. He says, listen, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to them the left as well. Or if someone asks you to go one mile, go two. Or if someone takes your cloak, sues you and wants your cloak, give them your tunic as well. We've talked about this in the past, but some of my favorite Christian ethicists will say what Jesus is inviting us to do there is not just kind of take abuse from those in power. But perhaps what Jesus is doing is inviting us to find ways of prophetically revealing how broken that person is. So if someone strikes you on the right cheek, usually they're backhanding you on that right cheek. But if in dignity you stand up and offer the left cheek as well, now in order for that person who thinks they're superior to the other enough to shame them with a backhand, now you have to make a fist and punch them on the left side, which now exposes me not as a person of power. Again, think about the last couple of weeks. Actually, it exposes an unbelievable sense of insecurity and weakness and ugliness. Soldiers could take a common person and have them carry something for one mile, but it was illegal for them to go further than that. And Jesus is saying, here's what I want you to do. Go a second mile. Some ethicists have said, it, it's kind of comical. It's, the picture is as though the Roman soldier chases you for another mile saying, wait, 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 like we're breaking the law here. Or Jesus invites those Somebody wants to take your, your cloak, that outer garment that is your source of protection and care and even your sleeping bag at some level. See, if they want to take your cloak, give them your tunic as well. By the way, in the Hebrew world, it's not shameful to be naked, but it's really shameful to see naked. So some have argued what Jesus is inviting us to do there is, 
if someone's so greedy they want to take what you have, give them everything and stand naked in front of them. And they'll go, oh, that's not good naked, right? Like that's, that's shameful. But it exposes their greediness. What I want you to see is that the cross serves as a kind of prophetic witness that the way the world operates is not the way it has to operate. And there are people who find, by the power of the Spirit, creative ways to live in dignity and to live against cycles of abuse, but to do that in ways that don't participate and further those cycles of violence and abuse. Are you with me? Which leads me to just one more P, and this one's not Mike's, this is mine the politic of the cross. Because if I think, I think if we take these, these priestly and presence and princely and prophetic aspects of the cross and we embody them in our life together, what emerges in our life together is a different way of living and being in the world, a different kind of politic. Very quickly, the first two or three centuries of the church, it wasn't perfect by far. But the people of God, the followers of Jesus, tried to embody this kind of way of living in the world. And because of it, they often ended up in martyrdom or they ended up in pandemics, not all that different than what we've just lived through, being present with those who are suffering. There's a way of being in the world. As I would say, the, the church discovered there is much when you follow Jesus to die for, but there isn't anything worth killing for. But then in the early part of the fourth century, an emperor by the name of Constantine got interested in Christianity. In fact, the story is kind of legendary. The empire was divided in a couple of ways and Constantine had to go into battle and Vegas had him at about eight point underdog going into the Super Bowl. He knew he was going to lose, but he had a vision. And in the vision, he sees the first two letters of Christ's name, the Chi and the Rho in Greek, but in a form that kind of shapes, is in the form of the cross. And in the kind of legendary version of the story, he hears a voice that says, in this you shall conquer. And he wakes up and he has all of, the, all of his soldiers paint that on their shields. And they go out as eight-point underdogs into the Super Bowl of Rome, and they end up winning by like 14. And all of a sudden, Constantine sort of wants Christianity on its side. And here's the, the important point of this. What is often called Constantinianism begins to happen in the life of the church. The church is no longer this unique people living out a cruciform way in the world. But now, oftentimes we think of nations themselves as Christian. But they aren't really Christian. They've just taken the symbol and painted it on their shield. Or now, too often over our history, we've gone out into the world and thanks be to God, I'm running out of time. So I'll just say, sometimes we go out even into things like, oh, let's say culture wars. With the cross painted on our shield, but with the methodologies of winning that are squarely shaped by the politics of the world. And sometimes in the midst of that, then we can become a people who are shaped by a politic where <laughs> I, I use Revelation in the statement, my favorite beast in the book of Revelation. And that's a terrible thing for a pastor to say. Almost sounds like we should have trading cards for Revelation, but my favorite beast, the one I want to collect. There's a beast in the 13th chapter of Revelation that looks like the lamb, but speaks like the dragon. It's the most fascinating beast to me. For too often, we can be a people who have painted the cross on our shield, but carry the weapons of the world. And therefore, we are called to be a people shaped and formed cruciformly. That doesn't mean that we are separate from the world. In fact, it means we are deeply concerned with being present in those places of injustice and brokenness in the world. But it also means when we go there, the ends don't justify the means. But we are a people who carry the cross with us and who carry the cross into the ways that we participate in the redemption of the world, wanting these cycles of violence and brokenness to come to an end as we participate in this ironic victory of God that is assured because the one who gave himself rose again. 
And we too who participate in that life will find that death is not the last word, but the new creation life of Christ is the final word. And so this morning we come and gather around the table because for us it's not enough just to kind of talk about that, sing about that, think about that, preach about that. But if you've listened well this morning, this is so challenging. This is the deep end of the pool of discipleship. It is an invitation to take it into ourselves over and over again until we become the body of Christ, the crucified body of Christ, the risen body of Christ for the sake of the world. In just a moment, I wanna lead us in a chorus and some folks, if you, ha if you haven't received elements, we'll, we'll serve you. But would you sing this with me as we prepare our hearts? There is a redeemer, Jesus God's own son, precious lamb of God, Messiah. And thank you, oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit to the work on earth is done. As we sing another verse, would you prepare the elements? Would you take that cellophane off and get the bread ready and the cup ready? and? just a moment, I'm going to invite you to hold those out in front of you as I pray a prayer of blessing. Jesus, my out in front of you. Almighty God, we hold in our hands very, very common things. About as common as food gets, not just only in our time, but in the first century. Common bread and common cup. But what we hold extends a mystery of grace to us, a, a grace that's greater than our sin. A grace that for many, if not most in this room, a grace that meets us in our brokenness and abandonment. A grace that somehow in its brokenness is actually the victory of peace. And it is a grace that invites us to participate in that life together, to become a people, as Peter says, a, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, God's own people. And so make us that today. Take these elements and may they be a means of grace to us. We confess that we are far more shaped by the ways that the world operates than we are by the cross, but we come to you this morning and invite you to keep changing us to be reflections of the cruciform life. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread. He raised it, gave thanks, and then he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Let us take and eat this morning in remembrance of him. After supper was over, he took the cup, blessed it. Redefined it as his blood, poured out for us to preserve us blameless unto everlasting life. Let us take and drink this morning in remembrance of him. May it be so, we pray today. May we become the body of Christ for the sake of the world. God's people said, 
Amen. Stand with me. And I will praise him. I will praise him. Praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give him glory, all ye people. For
Amen. Well, a quick midterm exam. If we are a people shaped with a scripture shaped imagination, a people who give ourselves over to worship, to be formed, to be reflections of the one we worship. If we have a posture of hope and a posture that invites the unity in all of God's creative diversity, if we are a people who who reflect the cruciformity of the cross and who are now sent into the world to be the feet of good news and peace in the world. Around here, we, we just call those kind of folk sanctified folk, right? If you want to know what holiness looks like, well, that's pretty much it right there. People transformed to be his reflection in the world. And so may the God of peace, may the God of peace himself, may he sanctify us through and through. May our whole spirit, our souls, and our bodies be kept sound and blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he who called us, he is faithful. And he will finish this work in us. And all God's people said, amen. Go in his peace.